Here's another video on evaluating limits. We're going to use algebra once again to evaluate these, not Lopi Tau's rule or anything else. All of these limits are going to involve square roots. And the tricky thing about these limits is that they are going to involve varying strategies. And, and we'll try to make sure we discuss why we're doing certain things in one of these limits and other things in another one. So let's go ahead and get into it. First limit that we're going to check out is here. So as always, what you want to do is you want to try to plug in what x is approaching. 4 in this case, and for the x's, what you get is you get 2 minus 2 in the top, 4 minus 4 in the bottom, you get 0 over 0. That's an indeterminate form. That's a signal that we would need to try to do something algebraically that eventually allows us to cancel something between the top and bottom of this fraction and reevaluate the limit after that cancellation occurs. So what oftentimes is going to work when you have 0 over 0 in a limit that involves roots uh, and the overall structure as a fraction is trying to rationalize. Rationalize means get rid of the root. Now one thing that I see students tend to want to do, they think, all right, I got to get rid of the root. I've got to square something. And that's correct if you're thinking about an equation. This is not an equation. There's no equal sign anywhere here. I'm not going to be able to square the top and square the bottom of the fraction. I'm not going to have the same mathematical value after carrying that out. So squaring is off the table here. But what you might remember from a prior course would be multiplying by a conjugate. So the conjugate of this numerator would be the same two terms with the sign in between switched from subtraction to addition in this case. And if I FOIL out my numerator, right, top times top when I multiply fractions, first times first is going to be the root times the root. That's the root squared. That gives me just this x that you see right here. When I do the outer multiplication, square root of x times positive 2, I get positive 2 square roots of x. But then check out what happens when I do the inner multiplication. The inner multiplication is going to be negative 2 times square root of x minus 2 square roots of x. When you multiply conjugates together, what always happens is that outer and inner multiplication from the FOIL process are going to cancel with each other. And then last times last is going to give me negative 4. So my numerator boils down to just x minus 4. Another thing that makes this sort of limit a little tricky and can go wrong for you, not necessarily wrong, but can push you off the track, is if you also FOIL out the denominator. Uh, that's not necessarily incorrect algebraically, but it's not beneficial in what we're trying to do, which is get some cancellation to occur. We would prefer for that denominator to stay written as multiplication, because if you think about writing it as multiplication, as you see in this fraction here, I can cancel the entire numerator with that factor of x minus 4 in the denominator, and when I put 4 in place of the only x that's left, I get square root of 4 plus 2, that is 4. Only other thing to remember is you have to have something holding the place of the top of that fraction. When everything leaves it, there's really a 1 holding that place. So the answer for this limit is 1 fourth. So the next one here, a little crazier looking initially, same initial step though. Uh, different variable, it's h approaching 0. We do the same thing with that change of variable as we did with x. Plug 0 in place of the h's, see what happens. So when you do that here, what you end up with is you end up with 0 in the top. And then you end up with square root of 3 minus square root of 3. You also end up with 0 in the bottom. Once again, that signals to us, do some algebra, get something to cancel. After that cancellation occurs, try to reevaluate the limit. Now, I'm actually going to use the same strategy here, but I wanted to make sure you're aware that the strategy that we just showed can work if there's a little bit more going on within your limit. So I'm multiplying by the conjugate of the denominator, same two roots sign in between those roots switched to addition. Top and bottom have to get multiplied by that. I have to multiply by a form of 1 to maintain my mathematical value that I'm starting with. What you see I've done in the numerator here, h squared times this, I've just written it as multiplication still. Same mindset as previously. There's going to be some stuff that happens where the roots initially are. I'm going to have to cancel something between the top and the bottom of the fraction eventually, I'm going to leave the numerator in this case written as multiplication so that I hopefully have that opportunity. The big transformation is going to happen in the denominator. When I do first times first, it's that bigger root times itself. That is the bigger root squared. That's going to give us what's inside that bigger root as the outcome. Now, once again, when I do outer times outer, I get positive root times root. 
but when I do inner times inner, I get negative root times root. Those are going to cancel when you multiply conjugates. That's always the case. And then when I do last times last, you really have to be careful with this. Uh, I think it's probably easiest to handle this in two portions. When I do a negative times a positive, I get a negative answer. And when I do the square root of h plus 3 times the square root of h plus 3, I get h plus 3, right? That's the square root of h plus 3 squared. This set of parentheses being overlooked is definitely going to cause your process to break down and, and fail you. So that last times last multiplication when you have more complex roots involved, handle it in a couple of pieces. Sine times sine is going to give you a negative in this case. And then root times root is going to give you what's inside the root, but that sign applies to that entire answer, which is why this set of parentheses is necessary. Now, if you distribute this negative in, you have an H and a minus H. You have a plus 3 and a minus 3. Denominator is going to boil down to just H squared. If I have H squared times this conjugate that I used initially, I can cancel the H squareds. Once those h squareds cancel, I can put 0 in place of these h's that remain in my numerator. That gives me square root of 3 plus square root of 3, which is 2 square roots of 3. Third example here, put negative 2 in place of the x's. What do you get? Negative 2 squared is 4. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6 plus 2. I get square root of 0. Now, square root of 0 is not that concerning if it shows up in general in math, but when it shows up within a limit, it is concerning because I can do the square root of a value bigger than zero and get a real number as the answer. But if I try to do the square root of a number that's smaller than zero, I'm going to get an imaginary answer and, and limits are not going to be associated with imaginary values. So I'm going to carefully try to identify what the domain of this function is. So what I did is I said, hey, I need what's under this root, x squared plus 3x plus 2. I need that to be 0 or larger. I'm needing to solve this inequality. So my strategy for solving this inequality, and this works for any inequality that you'd want to solve, I'm going to change it to an equation. And if I want to solve that equation, I can solve this quadratic equation by factoring. So I factor the left-hand side, and the two solutions I'm going to get are negative 2 and negative 1. I'm going to look back at this inequality symbol, see that it included the equal to portion. That's going to tell me closed circles need to go at those two solutions, negative 2 and negative 1 on the number line. And what happens is I have three sections of my number line, left of negative 2, between negative 2 and negative 1, and then right of negative 1. What you see this down here doing is it's basically testing each of those sections of the number line. I picked negative 3 to test this section of the number line. Does this satisfy my original inequality? And what you get when you simplify is 2 is greater than or equal to 0. Of course, that's true. That means that entire stretch of the number line is going to satisfy the inequality. If one value from there satisfies it, every value from that portion is going to satisfy it. When I pick a value from between negative 2 and negative 1, and I had to kind of go to an ugly value, negative 3 halves is about as nice as we can do, negative 1.5. What I end up with is I end up with negative one-fourth is greater than or equal to zero, which obviously is not true. I did not highlight that. This portion of the number line is not in the domain of the function. When I pick a test value from this stretch of the number line, I pick zero. It gives me two is greater than or equal to zero. That is true once again. This is within the domain of the function. Domain is identified on the number line with the highlighted sections. Anything from negative, two, negative infinity to negative 2, including negative 2, and then anything from negative 1 to infinity is able to go into this function. Why is that useful? Well, if I think about doing one-sided limits with this value negative 2, on the smaller side of negative 2, I am in the domain of the function. That gives me the green light to literally plug negative 2 in place of the x's and get my answer. Square root of 0 is 0. But if I think about the bigger side of negative 2, I am not in the domain for these values of x that are slightly above negative 2. Because, <laughs> I just noticed I can't spell very well, uh, because I'm not in the domain, this one-sided limit does not exist since values of x slightly above negative 2 are not in the domain. 
when one of the one-sided limits doesn't exist, the one-sided limits are not equal to each other, and there's no way that the general limit can exist. So the general limit is going to be one that does not exist because the one-sided limits don't equal to each other due to us not being in the domain of the function on the bigger side of negative 2. Last one for this video. This is kind of a combination of both of the things we've seen happen so far. Uh, so I'm going to put 0 in place of all the x's. What I get is I get square root of 0 over 0. So it's kind of both of the things that have happened throughout this video happening simultaneously. So what I did over here on the right side of the screen is I did some work to try to see what my root had going on with it. Uh, so when is what's under the root greater than or equal to 0? And in this case, uh, the only solution that I get, this is an imaginary value here, the only solution that I get is x equals 0. Both sides of the number line actually work in this case. So it's not quite like the last one because I'm not in the domain on one side of 0 and out of the domain on the other side of 0. So we're going to go more with the strategy that we did in the first few limits here, and that's let's try to do some algebra, see if we can push things to the point where we get some cancellation to occur. So what algebra can we do? I would really like to get something out of this root. I have a common factor of x squared under the root. So if I factor under the root, I would end up with this expression here. Why is that useful? Well, once you have this operation as multiplication, you can take the square root of either component that you know. I can take the square root of x squared and get the answer of x. Now, the sneaky thing about this particular problem is if you overlook this plus or minus, when you take the square root of x squared, things are going to break down. Why do we need the plus or minus? I don't know if x is positive or negative. I do know that I can square a positive or square a negative and get the answer represented by x squared. So I have to consider that plus or minus. Now, why is that significant? Well, if, if I think about being on the bigger side of 0, Values on the bigger side of zero means this x back here was positive, and I can take the positive portion of the answer. When this is multiplication, and you'll notice I also factored an x out of the denominator as a common factor, I can cancel those factors of x. I can put zero in place of the x's that remain. It's going to give me square root of one over two, or positive one half. What happens on the smaller side of zero? On the smaller side of zero, the square root of x squared is negative x. I can still cancel these x's, but now I have a negative out in front of that root that's in the numerator. I'm still going to get 1 when I put 0 in place of the x here, raise it to the fourth power, add 1, and take the root, but now I have to attach that negative out in front. In this case, the one-sided limits don't exist through this algebraic simplification, and therefore our general limit is not going to exist.